Hello, everyone. This is extra content for episode number 35 of Technoculture. My guest is Bibushan Shakya, research fellow in theoretical particle physics at CERN in Geneva, Switzerland. At the end of our main interview, I asked Bibushan if he could explain in simple terms some of the concepts that I found fascinating while preparing for the interview. I challenged him a bit by saying that a great scientist, they say, is one that can explain a very complex concept in very simple terms so that your grandma or a child could understand it. So in this clip, you're going to listen to three short explanations of very complex concepts in physics in simple terms. The first one is supersymmetry. Yeah, so one of the biggest theoretical ideas that has been driving the field of fundamental physics is supersymmetry, right? And supersymmetry is this profound idea that's profound at many different levels. So to understand the magic of supersymmetry, first we have to understand the magic of symmetry, because the idea of symmetry is actually at the very heart of fundamental physics, because symmetries tell us how things behave, right? So let me give you an example. Uh, so Symmetry basically means that when you do something to a system, it doesn't change, right? So that is a symmetry of the system. So for example, translation in space is symmetry of the laws of physics, as in if I do an experiment here versus if I do an experiment two feet over there, I should expect to get the same results, right? And that is, we think, a fundamental property of space that we live in, that the laws of physics are the same wherever we go in space. And that makes sense, right? That appeals to a very intuitive understanding that we have about uh, how space should behave. And it turns out that the symmetry is very useful because this essentially leads to the idea that momentum is conserved. So the law of conservation of momentum, if you, if you like to call it that, actually comes out of this idea that uh, translations in space should not change the laws of physics. And this is basically the link between symmetries and laws of physics, that symmetries will tell you uh, useful laws that you can use to understand uh, a system. Uh, for example, translations in time are also a symmetry of nature, as in, I do an experiment now, I do an experiment tomorrow, I should expect to get the same result. Right? It turns out that uh, time translation symmetry leads to the idea of conservation of energy. And so there are all these different symmetries that you can think of that your physics has, and that will tell you about important laws that are part of, of nature. Right, And so you think about space and time, and you think about what, what other symmetries could be there that particles are charged under. So you could translate things in time, you can translate things in space, you can give it a little bit of kick, right? So you can give it a little bit of velocity. These are all things that you can do to a particle, and that will tell you that there are certain energy conservation laws that this particle needs to follow. So these are space-time symmetries. There are a different class of symmetries called internal symmetries that have nothing to do with space and time. And these, for example, lead to the idea that electric charge is conserved, for example. Right? So conservation of electric charge comes from this idea that these particles are charged under some internal symmetry. And because that symmetry is conserved, it leads to this conservation of charge. So there are two kinds of symmetries. There are symmetries that are related to space and time. There are symmetries that are related to internal properties of the particles. And space-time symmetries, we think, are something more fundamental, right? Because we know there's space, we know there's time. We have experienced them since the beginning. And so properties of space-time, symmetries of space-time, are somehow more fundamental. And we thought these rotations and boosts and translations uh, were all the symmetries that particles could possibly have in space-time. But it turns out that there is a whole different class of symmetries that are also allowed in space-time. And these are more exotic, and they, in fact, change the identity of the particle. So they change particles that are matter fields into particles that are force carriers. And, and they change force carriers back into particles. And this class of symmetries is known as supersymmetry. So the idea of supersymmetry first came about because people were trying to understand how particles can have different symmetries in space-time and whether there could be any other symmetries other than internal symmetries, in fact, space-time symmetries, that particles could be charged under. And so supersymmetry was perhaps born out of that quest of understanding symmetries. But then later on, as people developed the, this idea of supersymmetry, they also realized that supersymmetry actually contains answers to all of these other deep questions of dark matter, of what the energy scale of the Higgs is as it is. All of these 
could actually be explained very elegantly in supersymmetry because all of these new force carriers that supersymmetry could uh, let you interchange matter particles for, these could solve all of these problems. Did I hear you mention earlier on in the main interview that recent experiments have proven supersymmetry wrong or part of it? Yeah, so, so that addresses a nuance in what we mean when we say something is not true. Right. So, so as I told you, supersymmetry is really at its core this idea that there is a greater symmetry in space time that allows you to interchange matter and forces. And that idea is still true. So, in that sense, supersymmetry is still as good of a theory as it used to be. But then I also told you that using that idea, people figured out that it could explain why the energy scale of the Higgs is where it is. And that is what we actually tested at the Large Hadron Collider. And that idea perhaps now is, has been falsified by data. That supersymmetry can explain why the energy scale of the Higgs is as it is. That is perhaps not true. Thank you for this explanation. The second one is somehow my favorite because it's the cutest thing I've ever heard in physics. It comes from a lecture that you gave at the University of Michigan for their series on Saturday morning physics. The presentation is called Higgs and the Beginning of the Universe. It was given in 2016, and it is available on the YouTube. In this lecture, at some point, you mention a baby universe in a black hole. I guess baby universe is in the same category as kittens and unicorns to me. So please, could you explain what you mean by baby universe in a black hole? Yeah, so baby universe is actually... Uh it technically it means something very specific, right? So a universe is something that is a closed system and it has its own laws. And those laws might be different from some other universe, right? So, so that is technically what it means for there to be a universe. And a baby universe is just something that is a universe that has just been born. And I think I brought up the term baby universe in a talk I gave about uh, fluctuations in the early universe that can create separate batches of parts of the universe that has its own fundamental constant. So, for example, the energy scale of the Higgs is different there than in the rest of the universe. And so in that sense, a baby universe is a part of our universe that is now separated from the rest of the universe. So there's no information flow back and forth between the two. And that universe just has its own laws of physics that are separate from the laws of physics in our universe. And why would this baby universe be in a black hole? Poor thing. So a black hole is, uh, physicists call it a singularity, right? Or an event horizon, meaning that it acts as a boundary through which nothing can pass back and forth. You cannot transmit information back and forth across this horizon. So this is, if you will, the boundary that separates one universe from the other. As in, you would never be able to go into this other baby universe and come back out again because it is shielded from our universe by a black hole. Thank you. The third and last concept I'm going to ask you to explain in simple terms comes from the same lecture I just mentioned. Early on in the lecture, at some point you say, space can travel faster than light. And that blew me away. And you added, there is nothing in our equations that prevents such thing that space can travel faster than light. Please explain. Yeah, so one of the perhaps more well-known laws of physics is that nothing can travel faster than the speed of light, right? The light is absolutely the fastest that anything can uh, go at. It's uh, an assumption that general relativity is built on. And it's true that, that no information can pass at a rate that's faster than the speed of light. Uh, but the law that nothing can travel in space and time faster than the speed of light does not apply to space itself. Right? So space itself can, in fact, uh, expand at a rate that's faster than the speed of light. And that is not, nothing in our equations prevent this from happening. And these days there are very well understood mechanisms as to how this might happen. And this could uh, play a crucial role in understanding how our universe is so big and yet everything we see seems to be very uniform. So no matter where you look at in the sky, even across billions and billions of light years, you would see that two patches of the sky perhaps have almost the same temperature. 
Right? And that could only make sense if all of these were part of the same space at a very early time and they just flew apart at a really rapid rate that even light could not come up with. And is this type of idea being tested at the moment? I mean, I assume that it's not enough to say that something is possible in your equations. At some point, you will have to observe it. But how do you observe such things? Right. So there's many different ways, uh, some more direct than the other, of testing these kinds of ideas. Right? So this idea is that space can expand faster uh, than light itself um, is this idea known as inflation. And inflation comes up with many different predictions. And if you could somehow test those predictions, you would, in principle, be testing this idea that the universe expanded at this crazy rapid rate early on in the universe. Right, so one of the, th the ways we understand uh, how this works is that there is a particle called the inflaton that has a tremendous energy density in the early universe. And, and that later on, uh, so that the inflaton provides the energy for the universe to expand at these crazy speeds. And then later on, the inflaton decays away and populates all of the particles we see in the universe. And so one of the ways to test these kinds of theories would be to discover the inflaton itself. And that is one of the things that we can do with these high-energy collisions at the Large Hadron Collider. Thank you so much for explaining these concepts in simple terms and for satisfying my curiosity. I'm sure it's not just mine because we always like to hear about these things. That's why they are in the media when there is a new discovery. And like we mentioned in the main part of the interview, we all understand the importance of fundamental research. It's something close to what it means to be human, actually. And you said it beautifully. Yeah, it's, it's difficult to explain that value of fundamental research, but uh, somehow we all understand it, right? And it's the same reason why we value music or why we value art or philosophy. It's not because it gives you some immediate practical return, but it just appeals to some, something profound that you need in your life to make uh, life meaningful. Well, I would like to close this segment by thanking you so much for the explanations and also for articulating this concept of the importance of fundamental research so beautifully and about curiosity and about what it means to be human and the beauty of the universe that is out there. I would like to congratulate you and your colleagues at CERN for the great work you do, which I not only find important, but somehow also a noble quest, right? Close to what it means to be human in every age, actually, not just our age and what technoculture is more interested in. So thank you for bringing beauty into this podcast. Thank you. Yes, yeah, so, but as someone once said, right, the value of physics is not that it's, the appeal of physics is not that it's so hard or it might be so useful, but it's so beautiful. Right? And, and that is why a lot of people get into it as a career. Thank you. And thank you for having me at CERN today.